and welcome. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement at JTS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session of our um, spring series, The Power of Emotion, Judaism, and the Inner Life. A special welcome to anyone joining us for the first time today, and uh, we encourage you to watch previous webinars in the series um, on the series page that is in the email that you received today. Uh, we're so pleased to have um, our alum, Dr. Edna Friedberg, teaching us today. Um, she is a JTS fellow and um, historian at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and her session is so aptly chosen for today, Valentine's Day, which some people are celebrating, remarking, um, love during the Holocaust, of course, uh, a different kind of take on this day. So we're, we're still looking forward to your session. Thank you for joining us. And I also really wanna thank our sponsor of today's session, Linda Zisk, who's sponsoring a loving memory of David Zisk at the Chacham level. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, if you are feeling inspired by this opportunity to learn with JTS with Outstanding Scholars, we invite you to consider sponsoring a session as well. We have three sponsorship levels, um, Chacham for 540, Tzadik for 1000, and Navi for 1800. And you can uh, learn more by emailing learningliz at jtsa.edu. Um, all right, on that note, I turn it over to Tani schwartz Herman for some additional information. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, I'm just gonna go over the uh, Q&A, uh, how we'll do the Q&A for today's session. Dr. Friedberg will pause for questions periodically throughout the session. And again, um, at the end of the session, please chat your questions to Rabbi Julia Andelman. Um, and she will select a few to present to Dr. Friedberg. Um, for any technical or logistical questions, uh, please initiate a chat with either myself or with Lynn Feynman. Uh, we'll be uh, screen sharing a PowerPoint presentation uh, in today's session. Um, Dr. Friedberg also uh, put together a selection of texts, um, which uh, we'll be sharing with you in the chat and she'll be um, reading from some of the texts as well during the session. Um, so pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Edna Friedberg, um, who, as, as Julia mentioned, is a JTS fellow and a historian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Dr. Friedberg received her PhD in modern Jewish studies from JTS where she wrote her dissertation on the origins of American Jewish services for the elderly. Dr. Friedberg regularly speaks to audiences across the country and her essays connecting Holocaust history with social, cultural, and political issues today have appeared in the Atlantic, Slate, Newsday, and um, The Forward. And um, I'm really looking forward to today's session. And I'm pleased to turn it over to Dr. Friedberg. Thank you, Tani, very, very much. Um, and thank you also, Rabbi Andelman. Being a JTS fellow is really one of my favorite things. Um, I can say unequivocally that uh, aside from big life decisions like who to marry, whether to have children, uh, going to grad school at JTS uh, really just set me on a path and has given me so much joy, so many connections with other scholars and a rich, rich base of uh, Jewish literacy, Jewish text to draw from. So I love being a JTS fellow. They did not ask me to say this, but I really love it uh, both to be able to teach you, but also for the opportunity it gives me to be regularly engaged with Jewish texts. Uh, and I'm glad that we are on this journey of learning together. Um, as Rabbi Andelman mentioned, today is Valentine's Day, a day that not all Jews celebrate, but many do, but it's certainly a moment when talk of love of different types is swirling around us. Um, it's in the news, it's in the TV when we flip channels, if we still do that, um, when we're streaming. And uh, when I was asked to come up with an emotion to present for this series on emotions that JTS is presenting, I looked and many of the emotions seem to be negative. And I understand why that would be because negative emotions are among the strongest emotions that we feel. When we are angry, it can be burning hot. It will be described as burning hot. Um, and sadness can also overwhelm us. But one of the other most intense emotions is love. And I really wanted to delve into it because in my uh, quarter century as a historian of the Holocaust, 
it has struck me again and again how often this emotion uh, comes up. And most often when we approach the study of the Holocaust, we do, throw, do so through kind of highly visible and well-documented historical events, things like German laws, uh, stripping Jews of their rights or big military events like the invasion of Poland, but inside those big moments are intimate stories and relationships that uh, galvanized people, that sustained people, and that also helped to heal people. And as you will see today, at times these relationships also put them at extra risk. So today I'll be sharing some stories about these three types of love, galvanizing, sustaining, and healing love during the Holocaust, and we'll be doing so in the words of people from the moment at the time, uh, from diaries themselves and from oral testimonies and other documents. So Tani, if you'd go ahead and start the slideshow, that would be great. And we will dive right in. Okay. Great, thank you. So, We'll begin at a place where a lot of Holocaust memory and especially Jewish Holocaust memory uh, rings true, I think, or is, is focused or is centered, which is in the Warsaw Ghetto. And I've chosen here a kind of random street scene uh, that gives you some sense of the, the chaos, the fear, the poverty, uh, but also the intense crowding and the sense that this is a place that is teeming with humanity um, boxed into this urban prison. Um, some of you may be familiar either from um, this prior session with me or from other learning about the Holocaust with the Oinek Shabbos archives, which was a clandestine archive that uh, Jews within the ghetto kept uh, in order to document what was happening to them. And so I will begin with a few items from this archive, which was uh, quite literally a time capsule that was buried in the ground. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, we are looking at a pre-war photograph of a Polish Jewish woman, an artist named Gela Zechstein. Uh, she was a painter and uh, she and her husband were active in this secret archive in the Warsaw Ghetto. And in fact, her husband, a man named Israel Lichtenstein, uh, was one of the people who took a very big risk in that he actually did some of the physical burying of these um, caches of documents, um, artworks, diaries, the, the whole time capsule, he helped to, to hide it. Um, so with her photo up there, I would like to read from Israel Lichtenstein's Last Testament. You have this in your uh, source guide, in your text guide, which I believe has been posted in the chat. It's source number one. And this is the last will and testament and excerpt from it that Israel Lichtenstein wrote in late July, 1942. This translation uh, comes from Lucy Davidovich. With zeal and zest, I threw myself into the work to help assemble archive materials. I was entrusted to be the custodian. And I'll jump ahead. I don't want any gratitude, any monument, any praise. I want only a remembrance so that my family, my brother and sister abroad may know what has become of my remains. I want my wife to be remembered. Gayla Zechstein, artist, dozens of works, talented, didn't manage to exhibit, did not show in public. During the three years of war, and if we can go to the next slide, Tani, she worked among children as an educator, a teacher, and this is one of her paintings. She made stage sets, costumes for children's productions, and now together with me, we are preparing to receive death. I want my little daughter to be remem remembered. Margalit, 20 months old today. She has mastered Yiddish perfectly. At nine months, began to speak Yiddish clearly. In intelligence, she is on par with three or four-year-old children. I don't want to brag about her. The teaching staff of the school at Novolipki 68 tell me so. I am not sorry about my life and that of my wife, but I am sorry for the gifted little girl. And he ends with Jews will not be annihilated. Now, this is a fairly grim example of love, and I promise I will be showing you lighter ones. Um, but this painting done by Gayla Zechstein, and if you can go to the next slide, um, is among those and the will and testament that were buried in containers like this, a rusty milk can or metal boxes uh, that went beneath the earth. And in fact, the Novolipki school that he mentioned, the place where he said, don't take my word for it. The teachers at the school say that my kid is gifted, uh, is one of the main sites 
where the Oinik Shabbos archives were buried. And in the next slide, we have an image of uh, people going through, you can see as they're opening up these dirt encrusted, rusted uh, containers from underneath war-torn Warsaw as they are sifting through what remained. So we often talk about, and Tani, I'm not sure, I don't see myself. Can people see me or? We can see. I, yeah, okay. I can so see. Just making sure. So that's fine. I don't need to see myself. I just wanted to make sure other people would. So. And Dr. V, it, and if that helps, like you can also pin yourself that way. Yeah. That's right. Continue to, okay. I don't need to pin myself. I just okay. wanted to make sure that others right. were because it's just so hard. Sometimes you feel you're speaking into the void on these. So, so I think many of us have heard uh, the kind of um, myth that if a, a parent sees their kid uh, in a in a condition of mortal danger, they can, can perform deeds of superhuman strength, right? The idea that like if a mother sees her kid about to be hit by a car or pinned under a car, she could lift the car. I don't know if such things are actually true, but it's the kind of thing that we uh, talk about uh, or kind of celebrate in our society. The idea that parental love can overcome any obstacle knows no bounds. And many of us have felt it either as a parent ourselves or as a child or in what we wish a parent would have done for us. Um, and some strength, though, is not like superhuman lifting of a car or dashing to save a child. Some is invisible. And I would like to turn to uh, oral history testimony from a mother, uh, a Jewish woman named, uh, she was born Herta Katz, uh, born in Germany in 1908. So she was a full-fledged adult at the time of the war, which is not always a voice that we are used to hearing. Uh, as a young woman, a married woman, she and her husband, um, she had the married name Wolfart, uh, they moved to Amsterdam, very much like the family of Anne Frank. Many German Jews went to the Netherlands in the 30s, seeking a more um, accepting and less stressful environment. And it was there that their daughter Doris was born. And after the German invasion of the Netherlands in spring 1940, she and her husband spent a year uh, on edge, preparing for the possibility that they might have to leave their young daughter with strangers for her own safety, that she could be hidden with a family separate from her parents. And so in this very short clip that you're about to hear, um, Herda, now known after the war as Helen Waterford, reflects back on what it felt like to prepare to uh, let go of her child and what they did to make it easier for her. Sorry about that. Uh, just give me one minute. Let me go back there. Okay, it's a lot of toggling. So thank you for driving for me. My daughter didn't know she was hiding. As I said, she was not five yet. And um, we, my husband and I, had more than a year ago decided, since we knew of children transports from Germany to England, maybe that would be one day possible. So we would give away our child any place we knew where she would be welcome. And why should she maybe has to die when she can live a good life? We have a family in the United States who were only too happy to take her. So we decided that we, that to make it to her, for her heart, not to kiss her anymore, not to have her too close physically. Both of us did that. And, um, and it has helped her. Because when, when we had the, 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 the time that she had to leave, and we told her, she was an outgoing child. She uh, would go and visit uh, a couple, and they have no children, and they would so much like to see her. And she, she was, she always liked to visit people. So when those other people came, they talk, took her. They took, when they came on a Sunday afternoon, and uh, we didn't know their name, we didn't know where they lived, and 
she saw them and we told us, yes, those are the friends who would like you to see where they are living. See, they, they have no children. And she went with me to, we went with her to the, to the streetcar and we said goodbye, like that. No kissing, nothing. That comes afterwards and this is very personal and um, it's ridiculous to say that it's difficult because it never changes. It never changes for all those years because it was 45 before we, we saw it, before I saw it. So I think you can hear the emotion in her voice, this woman doing one of the most wrenching things you can imagine that for a year, she and her husband uh, minimized their physical affection and love for their daughter in the hope that it will make separating from them easier and then give her up to people when she says, we don't know their names, we don't know where they live. That was for everyone's protection so that they could not, let's say if captured or tortured, give up their daughter's hiding place. And for four years, they had no idea if she was alive, no way to get word to her or from her. Um, if you know of any more uh, selfless love than that, uh, tell me, because I, I cannot imagine uh, what that must have been like. Um, I'd like, though, to transition to a type of love, um, romantic love, and also teenage love, both romantic and platonic, which I think is more what we think of when we think of that word. Um, there was a, another person writing in the Warsaw Ghetto, a man named Labe Golden. And in August 1941, he wrote the following. And um, it's not this one yet. So if you could just show me, Tani. Thank you. Um, this translation is actually by one of my teachers from JTS, Professor David Roskies, uh, in his book, Literature of Destruction. Labe Golden is writing what he calls a chronicle of a single day, where he is hungry and overwhelmed by starvation, and he is writing about it. And this is number three in your source uh, guide. If you would like to read along, it is text number three. He writes, somewhere in the world, there is still something called love. Girls are kissed and girls kiss and return. And couples go walking for hours in the gardens and the parks and sit by a river, such a cool river under a spreading tree. And they talk so politely to each other and laugh together and gaze in such a friendly way, so lovingly and passionately into each other's eyes. And they don't think about food. They may be hungry, but they don't think about it. And they're jealous and they become angry with each other, again, not eating. And all this is so true and it is all happening in the world. Far away from here, true, but it is happening. Sick fantasies, interrupts the scoundrel, my stomach. He's woken up, the cynic. What a dreamer. Instead of looking for a practical solution, he lies there deluding himself with nonsensical stories. There are no good or evil stomachs, no educated or simple ones, none in love and none indifferent. In the whole world, if you're hungry, you want to eat. And Actually, uh, Labe Golden's stomach is wrong. I know I have read some studies that show that when people are in love, actually, they don't sleep very much. Maybe some of you have experienced this. They don't sleep as much. They don't eat as much. They just kind of become intoxicated on this feeling. But in this case, Labe Golden is uh, remembering it and as something that gives him distraction and consolation. Um, should I pause now for questions or do one more story? I don't have questions yet, so let's invite people to, uh, to send me questions for Dr. Friedberg if you have them, and why don't you do one more? Great. I think as we get into the more personal stories, people will, will want to know more. So Tani, now, if you don't mind, if we could go to the next slide, please. So as I said, I want to turn to some of these love stories, the kind that Leib Golden is imagining, because in fact, they were happening in the most unlikely of places, um, in the depths of the Holocaust. Um, but first, let's turn to early 1940s Germany and a story of teenage love uh, between the two teenage boys that we see here. On the left, a German Jewish boy uh, named God Beck, and on the right, a German Jewish boy named Manfred Lewin. Uh, these are kids who were around 10 years old when the Nazis rose to power in Germany in 1933. 
And as Jewish teenagers, they faced Nazi persecution. They were excluded from schools. They couldn't go to parks and swimming pools. Their parents were increasingly economically impacted, could not work where they wanted. And as an additional thing, uh, in fall of 1935, they were stripped of their citizenship as part of the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, and the Nuremberg Laws also banned sexual relationships between Jews and non-Jews. So you have this stranglehold happening on German Jewish life, and many German Jews then turned to kind of internal organizations for companionship and comfort. And this is where God and Manfred met. Uh, they both joined a Zionist youth group, and in 1940, they met. And God, years later, uh, remembered in a memoir, he wrote that he didn't even really notice Manfred at first, and that the bond between them developed first at an intellectual level. But their relationship soon blossomed into a romance. Now, I also want to remind you that uh, same-sex relationships between men were also prohibited by law under the Nazis. And in fact, over the course of 1933 to 1945, an estimated 100,000 gay men were uh, arrested for having a one of these forbidden relationships. So this just made life already precarious for God and Manfred as Jewish teens even more precarious. But they found ways to fall in love. They would sometimes spend the night together on cots as part of uh, participating in air raid patrols. That was an obligatory service they did. But for them, it was a, a chance to be alone. And in the collections of the Holocaust Museum, we have, as you'll see in the next slide, um, a precious artifact, uh, a gift that Manfred gave to God. Um, it is a booklet, a sort of memory book or journal called, and he's written on it in German, Do You Remember When? And if we can open to one of the pages inside, it is very much the kind of thing like a yearbook or a, a journal that teenagers write to each other. Um, Manfred wrote poems there to his boyfriend and God remembered that uh, his poetry, and I'm quoting, he says, is, his poetry wasn't the greatest, but that doesn't matter. The message was clear. Should we be torn apart someday, we could still count on our love and would always hear each other call for help. If you can flip another page or two, please. Um, he drew pictures you see here of a room where they were, um, and um, they were a comfort to each other. Um, in the last in part of the book, Manfred wrote to God, he said, I owe you a present, not just so that you get something from me that you can glance through and lay aside forever, but something that will make you happy whenever you pick it up. And in the end, it was the only thing that uh, God would have from Manfred. By the summer of 1942, many of their friends had already been deported and people may be surprised to know that there were still many Jews in Germany at that time. And in fact, many German Jews were deported later than in parts of occupied Europe like Poland. Um, Manfred was categorized as fully Jewish under the Nazi regime, but God, whose mother was Protestant, was half Jewish and that status shielded him. And in the fall of, Manfred, of fall of 42, Manfred and his family were uh, ordered to de report for deportation. They were going to be sent for quote unquote work in the East and desperate for a way to save Manfred um, and maybe let's go back to their faces, Tani, if we could, just to remind ourselves, we're talking about really young people here. Um, God actually, uh, on the left, um, recklessly, he actually went to the assembly camp where the Lewin family and Manfred were being held. He had borrowed a Hitler youth uniform from someone and with a lot of chutzpah, uh, asked to speak with Manfred. He hoped to rescue him, somehow finagle him coming out, convince him to go into hiding with him. But Manfred would not leave his family, would not leave his parents. And they were deported to Auschwitz where the entire family was murdered. Uh, God himself went underground as part of a resistance group. Um, but he, and he later um, moved to Palestine, spent the rest of his life in Israel, but he never really got over the loss of, of Manfred. Um, he wrote later that Manfred's name years later still electrified me. So a love story. Um, one with a tragic end. Um, let's jump ahead in the slides, Tani, because teenagers form very intense bonds, as we know, they, uh, we can stop actually on that page for a moment. Yeah, that's one where it shows that he uh, inscribed this memory book 
on the 24th, 21st of May, 1942, and had written in top in Hebrew that it was Shavuot, um, that that's when he wanted to uh, give him this gift. Next slide, please. Teenagers, and I am a parent of teenagers, I can tell you, I'm sure many of us know, their moods can be quite intense and their friendships are equally intense. They feel like they will be friends forever. They feel everything very deeply. And this was true also during the Holocaust and in fact inspired some of the events that we most often celebrate today. Some of what were perhaps brave, but perhaps also reckless uh, acts of, of violent resistance because teenagers feel invincible and together uh, can talk themselves into doing a lot of things. We are seeing here a photograph of the Krakow ghetto um, in Southern Poland. And I would like to turn to one more text in your uh, guide. This is number two, um, text number two. This is from the diary of a teenage girl named Gust Gusta Davidson Dranger. She is writing in 1942, so the same year that uh, God and Manfred are together in Germany. But instead, she is writing about uh, a secret Friday night, a Shabbat, Arab Shabbat gathering of a Zionist youth group um, in a period where there are mass deportations happening from Krakow to the Belzhitz Killing Center. And again, she talks about how feelings of connection and love could just pull you out of the space you were in and into another uh, mindset altogether. So from text two, if you'd like to read along, um, I will uh, jump around a little, but this is what she remembered of those Friday night. From the grayness of a weekday, one is suddenly plunged into a festive mood. The girls in white blouses, the boys in white wide collared shirts took their places around the table. First, a moment of silence, then a burst of song, greeting the Sabbath, greeting Shabbos. Eyes gleamed in the candlelight. Strong emotions were reflected in those wide open black pupils. This is the way it had always been for years and years in a quiet village in the noisy city high up in the mountains among the factory smokestacks. They had come to greet the Sabbath with the same song, same emotions, and today it was the last time together. It was our last supper. In a corner, Martusha, a teenage girl, wide-eyed, staring at the radiant faces at the flaming candles. This was her first Shabbat away from home. She left Tomashov a few days ago when the action, that would be the deportation, had already started, aware that she might never again see her parents. She is alone, all alone in the world. Only 17, her eyes wide, she scans the room. She does not feel pain. She does not long for her lost home, for that carefree girlhood which has gone forever. Here is her place among this youthful company, and she feels happy in the crowded room. Now, of course, this is the diarist's interpretation, and it is an ideological one of Martusha, the idea that somehow being swept up in the uh, community and uh, friendship embrace of this Zionist youth group would make her forget about being torn away from her parents. Maybe it might be exaggerated. I'm going to guess she felt plenty sad, plenty scared. But still, what does ring true is the idea that there was comfort, that there was some kind of um, balm for pain in joining together with other young people who had suffered similar losses and in becoming each other's families, each other's support. Um, and this again is a document that is written uh, at the time during the war. I would be happy to pause for questions if people have questions. Um, we do have some questions. Okay. Um, this is heavy stuff, needless to say. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, there was a question about, um, you, know, you mentioned that the Nazis were, um, you know, uh, forbade same-sex relationships um, and persecuted gay men. Um, and the question was about, were they unique in that? Was the Jewish community or the broader culture actually uh, accepting of same-sex relationships at that time? So they were not unique in that, um, but they were intensifying existing trends. So in 1920s and early 1930s, uh, Germany, especially in Berlin, there was actually uh, a much more tolerant environment 
for both gay men and lesbian women. Um, and it's part of uh, probably the most familiar to people might be like the movie or musical cabaret, that there was this um, subculture, I wouldn't say it was mainstream or that people would have found easy acceptance from their families, for example, but there was this uh, meeting place in the city where many gay men and women came from all over Germany and from elsewhere in Europe to be part of a, an artist culture and one that had much um, more progressive and new sexual mores and social mores. So there actually was in Imperial Germany um, law that prohibited um, homosexual relationships as there was in much of Europe and in most states in the US, in fact, maybe all states until quite recently. Um, so the Nazis were not introducing something altogether new when they prohibited these relationships, but in the past they had rarely been enforced the laws and the penalties were much less. So people who were denounced as gay, and again, you didn't have to be, let's say like quote unquote caught in the act or have evidence like a love letter between boyfriends. The word of a neighbor saying, I know that he is a gay man could be enough to have a, a person sent to a concentration camp where uh, gay men and gay prisoners were especially vulnerable to violence and physical abuse. So it took existing cultural and legal trends and intensified them. Um, someone noticed, as I did as well, that um, that last page that you showed us from, from the book uh, that one gave to the other, not only it said Shavuot in Hebrew and uh, at the top, but it also said at the bottom, Chazak Bemats, which is um, in the words Moses says to Joshua, as you know, to kind of be strong and have courage, which takes on a whole new meaning um, in this context. Yeah, thank you to whoever pointed that out. Thank you. Um, a few people asked about um, how about Helen Waterford reuniting with her daughter, and um, I think you said she did. And uh, so, did she? And and how how did she manage to do that, not knowing, you know, where she went or with whom? She did reunite. I know that her husband did not survive the war, um, and she came back and found her daughter again. I don't remember the details of how, although I'm happy to to look it up. But I imagine it was through whatever connection in the Dutch underground had originally helped her to make the link. Um, but I know that also, as with many hidden children, their reunion was a fraught one, that when you come back, especially to a child who's so young, at the time of the initial separation, the biological parent is a stranger. Um, they no longer remember their parent. Um, I have done interviews with a number of hidden children who talk about feeling extremely traumatized and upset by the quote unquote reunion with parents who they don't know at all and don't remember and with the identity they have to have. So I don't remember the mechanics of how Helen Waterford found her daughter, but I know that the husband did not return. It's a whole um, new heartbreak all over again. Yes. Um, all right, so more of a, kind of a method question. Um, someone was asking about the, the containers, um, who, who thought to start this, how did the news spread from the various ghettos and camps? Did the Nazis ever find some? Did they destroy them or, or keep them? As, um, as we know, they kept a lot of documentation. How many contain these containers? Did we have lots of questions about the containers? Sure, and I'll make a plug for a previous session that I've done um, for JTS with the Fellows Program, which I think is recorded, right, Julia? Um, if people wanna see it or not. And with, as part of our Monday like, series? Yeah, like the spiritual yeah. resistance one I did where I yeah. focus more exclusively on ghetto archives. So yeah. um, the founder of the, the Oinig Shabbos archive in the Warsaw ghetto was a man named Emanuel Ringelblum. Uh, he did not survive the war, but he uh, was the person who came up with the idea and who um, rallied dozens and dozens and dozens of what he called Zamlers, which is the, the Yiddish word for a, a, a gatherer. Um, who would collect or a collector who collected all kinds of materials. So they range from things like the last will and testament I read to you, which was not a last will and testament for um, physical belongings, but for memories, um, artwork like the painting I showed, official German orders, um, posters for events in the ghetto, photos, letters, diaries, angry fights between people, jokes. I mean, it's really just this time capsule uh, and it was buried um, not only in the kind of milk can that I showed you, which is about, I don't know, three feet high. It's big. It's not a milk can for someone's personal use, but would have been used by a dairy farmer to deliver milk. 
um, and pour out into smaller containers. Uh, and also in metal boxes as well. Not all of them were recovered after the war uh, because their locations could not be determined. Um, landmarks were destroyed. The, most of Warsaw, but especially also the area of the ghetto was completely leveled in fighting uh, between the Soviets and Germans. And only a few of the Oinig Shabbos activists also uh, came back alive. So there are still some treasures that are undiscovered underground. The reason that they were in these milk cans and boxes is that uh, a milk can, if it's designed to keep liquid in, you know, so it doesn't slosh around in delivery, it's also pretty watertight to keep liquid out. And so it was considered a, a strong and dry place to put papers. Um, a couple of people mentioned um, a, a documentary called who will write our history about the Oinik Shabbos archives. Is that yeah. something that you would recommend? Strongly recommend. Also a book of the same title, Who Will Write Our History by a scholar named Samuel Kassow, K-A-S-S-O-W. Um, very powerful, very moving. Totally agree. You know, when you were talking about the, the miscellany that was in these um, canisters, it, it, it made me think of the Cairo Geniza and just all of the stuff they threw in there. Um, but, you know, as a historian, is that is that an appropriate comparison at all? Absolutely. In that it is a place where people are putting um, pieces of paper that are kind of a jumble. They're not in any necessary order, but they know that this is a place that it's a repository, a conscious repository. But in the end, it's both um, a varied but also incomplete uh, set of documents that help us get a window into society. So I absolutely agree. Do you want to continue? Um, yes, yes, I do. So I'm going to be turning more to um, more testimonies, more oral histories, uh, so that you hear less from me and more from people for whom this is their actual life experience. I want to give you a little background on the testimonies we'll be hearing. Uh, because in some superficial way, they are all three about the same uh, topic, about food. Again, returning to the question of hunger, of starvation, which dominated so much of the thoughts of Jews during the Holocaust, whether in ghettos or in camps, uh, because it was obviously the difference between life and death. But in that same way, because of the centrality and the necessity and scarcity of food, Giving food or keeping food or sharing food was a very important way to show love and to show loving sacrifice. And so we'll be looking at three brief clips uh, from decades after the war of women looking back on a loving relationship they had and how it was expressed through food. Uh, the first one is from a woman uh, as a child. She was known as Ruth Mushkis. Uh, she was born in 1935 in the Polish town of Ostrowiec. Uh, when she grew up, her married name was Weber. And let's hear her describing what it was like when she was one of the very few children alive in Auschwitz with her mother. In some instances, parents in camps try to conceal young children living with them. From the age of six, Ruth Mushkis lived with her mother in a series of labor camps. When she was nine years old, Ruth was liberated from Auschwitz. In the first camp that we were, food was not a problem because um, um, I guess my father still had money and there would be food brought in from uh, the Aryan side, from the Polish side. So food at that camp was not a problem. But in the other camps, when we were in Stachowicz and then in Ostrovce and in Auschwitz, I mean, our portions were so small to start with. Um, when I finished mine, my mother's was always waiting for me. <laughs> she, she actually made me believe that she wasn't hungry. And whatever she had, she shared with me. So that's why I'm here. So again, we have a case of um, profound maternal sacrifice 
the perspective of what it feels like to a little kid who just believes that her mother says what she means and is used to being taken care of. And in this case, uh, it saved her life. Um, the next testimony that we'll hear, and I'll talk a little more about them in relation to each other after we watch, um, is uh, from a woman named Cecily Klein Pollock. Um, we're looking here at a photograph that is taken in the spring of 1944, the arrival of mass deportations of Hungarian Jews that took place, uh, over 400,000 Hungarian Jews. It was the last intact Jewish community in all of German occupied Europe. They arrived over the course of just a few weeks in May and June 1944, and we're seeing here photographs of a deportation train arriving. Among those who was deported to Auschwitz at this time uh, was a teenage girl, actually a young woman, she would have been um, 19 at the time, named Cecily Klein, later Cecily Klein Pollock. And we will uh, hear from her talking about her relationship with her sisters in the camp. We were called the two good sisters because we could no, we wouldn't, because it came to a point where even sisters would take away each other's food. And with us it was that we would fight only that the next one should take a bite more or she should have more. She would, she would cry why I didn't eat up my, my bread because I was, I was afraid after we didn't eat like for three days and we had that experience. So I would try to save up a piece of bread in case we are not going to have the next day. And then if there was if there was that they, they, a search. So they were not allowed to find, if they would find the bread, they would take it away and they would still beat me up. So I would beg my sister, help me eat, help me. They're going to, to beat me up if they find bread. So she would cry why she has to, she, that she's eating my bread and I will have that much less and, 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 and I may uh, you know, die sooner or I won't survive or I get sick. Yes, we could only, and it was, Everybody had to have somebody, and if you, if you didn't, then you didn't survive, no matter how strong you were, unless you had some kind of a choice uh, uh, position, like a block eldest or a, or a Stubendienst or a capo, then you could survive. So I know she used a lot of foreign language terms there, um, and I can explain them if you want, but I think there are a couple of elements that are so powerful and significant in this deceptively brief clip. One, I don't know if you caught, I hope you did at the beginning that she said she and her sister were known as the good sisters because they shared food. Why? Because so many sisters were not, they would even steal from each other. And I'm sure these are people who had some love for their sibling, but that in an absolutely desperate, um, miserable situation, people sometimes become very selfish. It is natural, it is human, or it is animal of us to do. And that we don't wanna put some kind of gloss on this that everyone behaved in angelic ways because there are many, many stories of betrayal um, among family members, between friends. And in this case, hers stands out because they were so caring and selfless. But at the end, she talks about how sustaining that was. It's not just about the bread. You get the sense that it's also you need someone who you can care for and who cares for you, who nurtures you emotionally and who gives you a purpose and living. And in Cecily Klein Pollock's testimony, and I'm sure if we could have heard from Ruth Mushke's mother, um, that same drive and that way love is a fuel that helps to keep them alive in addition to whatever the actual food is doing. I'd like to play one more clip that is along the line of food and relationship. Uh, this one from a woman named Bella Yakubovich, will... later, later Bella Tovi. Uh, she was born in 1926. I'll mention where she was born, just it's been in the news. She was born in 1926 in the Polish town in Western Poland near, uh, named Sosnowicz. Uh, that's the same town. Sosnowicz is the same town where Vladek Spiegelman, um, the father of Art Spiegelman, the author of Mouse, which has been in the news so much lately, he was also from Sosnovitz. And let's hear Bella Tovi uh, describing her friendship in the camp. Many people in concentration camps formed close friendships, often referred to as camp families. My camp sister's name was Frida Ringler. Frida and I were like sisters. She was Czech, 
we became friendly in Graben, the first camp, and we shared everything. When Frida got an extra bowl of soup for some extra work, she would say half of it, even if I wasn't around. When she got an extra piece of bread, she would leave me some. When I had an extra soup, I remember I would always make a line on that bowl to Markov, which is hers. And I remember eating that soup and eating it so slowly, and I would eat, and I would come so close to what was Frida's part. For sure, I'm sure, never, never giving her an extra spoon, but never taking a spoon of hers. I never cheated on Frida, and I don't think she ever cheated on me. I cannot tell you the number of times I have seen that clip over the years, and it moves me every time. Just the honesty of it, but how foundational and core clearly that friendship was to Bella surviving um, physically, but also emotionally. And they were deported um, together from camp to camp. So many of these relationships were sustained, consistent, and, and life-saving. Um, I'm happy to pause again for questions. Julia, if there are more, or should I keep going? I don't have more questions right now. I think people are just kind of um, dumbstruck by, by these clips. That's yeah. That's how I'm feeling. <laughs> um, well, someone, um, or someone just asked, okay, now they're coming in. Um, when did Frida survive? One person asked, uh, sorry, did Frida survive? And um, let, let's, yeah. Do you know if yes. she did that? Yes, she yeah. and Bella both survived and maintained wow. a relationship after the war. Wow. Um, and someone asked when the videos, when these videos were made, the clips that you're showing us. Uh, the clips that I just showed, not all the clips, but the ones that I just showed are part of a film that was made for the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, where I work. And you can actually see they are part of our permanent exhibition. Uh, but they're, yeah, they're part of our old oral testimony. So these were filmed in the late 80s and early 90s. So, so we, could, we could find the longer video on your website? Yeah, saying? and I'm happy to uh, supply links or also if someone would like to see a full testimony from the person. I mean, one of the things that is very interesting when looking at oral history is to see the full arc of someone's life experience, but then also to look for common themes like this, like relationships expressed through food and see what is repeated, what is distinct among them. Um, and so that's hope, part of what I'm hoping to give you a glimpse of today. And I know it's heavy stuff. When I just move on, I'm not flippant. I just, that's how we got to do it, so. Yeah, you know, just seeing um, the, the way you're collecting this material, it's really making me um, think about love as a survival mechanism um, in a way that, that I really never had. It's, 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 it's enlightening, <laughs> bringing it all together like this. I'm glad. And it's one of the things that I tell people why it's so important, um, it, including and especially non-Jewish people, to learn about Jewish life before the war. It's not just a memorial function for what is lost, but if you don't understand who the people were, what their personal histories were and relationships and worldview before the war, then there is no way to analyze how they react in conditions of extreme stress or fear or decision making we all bring the totality of who we are to every situation. And so, for example, if you look at um, self-help networks, mutual aid networks in ghettos, they are usually built on uh, pre-war organizations or pre-war friendships, not just relatives, but people who were involved in Bundist, that's Jewish socialist activities together or Zionist groups together, uh, or who followed the same Rebbe before the war. You know, you stick to the communities you know, and uh, thankfully, I hope that very few people on this program, if any, have experienced conditions like these. But I think we all know that in times of stress, you really see who your friends are, who are the solid relationships, who really loves you, and who just kind of is around for the superficial fun. And this is obviously the most extreme kind of example, but it shows that um, the power of these kind of connections and nurturing. Um, one person commented that he's heard that that it's been said that that 
relationships like these camp sisters, um, you know, really were, were closer than, you know, than married couples or, or blood relationships and, and endured after the war, um, as, as you mentioned, they did. Um, and, and someone asked if the Nazis made, um, did they try to break up relationships, friendships like these that, that formed in the camps? Interestingly, I have not heard about that. And you'd think that they would because it would um, break people down. You know, it breaks down morale. It also reduces chances for, um, for uh, resistance. There are cases, and I'll be giving an example in a few minutes of uh, when people were having uh, romantic relationships during the war of those being broken up or abused. Um, but in terms of sharing food, it doesn't seem like they were monitoring at that level very often. Um, well, I can't not share this comment. Someone wrote, Frida was my cousin. Oh. Bella covered Frida with her body when she got cold. Oh, thank you, whoever said that. Um, and someone also um, mentioned a book called The Sisters of Auschwitz by Roxanne. I don't know how to say this in Van Iperen. Is that a, a book that you know of or would recommend? I'm not familiar with it. Okay. Thank you for telling us that about Bella and Frida. Yeah. That is so evocative and powerful. Thank you. Um, there's a question about, well, I'll ask it. Why not? Uh, it's, a, it's a big question. Um, how do, um, this, I'll just read it the way she wrote it. How do Holocaust deniers, um, what do Holocaust deniers say or how do they react to these, to these testimonies that they sort of continue to deny in the face of such testimonies? Yeah, they think it's made up or what is more common today rather than outright denial is Holocaust distortion or minimization where they'd say like, yes, yes, some Jews were killed, but not on the scale that Jews claim and that uh, Jews claim it because they want money or to justify the existence of the state of Israel. I mean, all Holocaust denial at its root is anti-Semitism. So it has to have some um, element of being divorced from reality because so much of what we know about the Holocaust, and I, I say this often, especially to young people who say, you know, why do we talk so much about the Holocaust? There have been many, many atrocities over the years. It's because it is the best documented crime in human history. That's how I think about it. And that so much of the evidence that we have about the Holocaust, why it was carried out, how it was carried out, by whom, where the scale is left for us by the perpetrators themselves. So for someone who seeks to deny the Holocaust, they would say that these people are actors or exaggerating. Um, and there's just not really a place to start there, but that is a reason that I feel like it's so important to put all the evidence out there in as unfiltered a form as possible. Let people look at it and um, evaluate. I'll say I did a presentation on a totally different topic um, for a, a large actually accounting firm. It was sort of part of a DEI like um, diversity initiative related to anti-Semitism. And a woman wrote in, this is a, a professional woman. She has worked many years at a, a, a nationally known accounting firm. And she messaged me privately in the chat to say that she, she was raised that the Holocaust didn't happen or was exaggerated and that she was having to re-educate herself entirely. And this is a woman with advanced degrees um, she lives in Missouri. I, I was very Im impressed and touched that she actually said that to me. And um, but it's it's has much more currency than we might like to to think. Thank you. Do you want to keep going with your presentation? Yes. So I'm going to be turning to some more stories, uh, really focusing on romantic love. Um, and if we can go to the next picture, we are looking here at a photograph of a young Polish Jewish girl named Renia Spiegel. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with her name. Um, I was not until a couple of years ago. She uh, grew up in the Polish town of Przemysl. Try saying that 10 times fast. Uh, it has one vowel, Przemysl. Um, and for her, love was sustaining. She was a avid, avid diary keeper. And I mentioned Anne Frank before, she is of course the most famous diarist of the Holocaust, but there are many, many hundreds and hundreds of Holocaust diaries that have survived. And when I say she was avid, Renya Spiegel kept a diary or kept a few volumes of diaries where she poured out her heart for more than 700 pages. 
she um, wrote uh, in Polish, that was her native language as it was for many um, Polish Jews. And um, a few years ago, her diary was translated and you can see it online. The link is in the text guide that I gave you um, through people at the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian Magazine. And they have very long excerpts. Uh, I wanna read you just a few of them, um, but part of what is just so relatable and at times humorous and at times sweet and at times heartbreaking in her diary is that she is what we used to call, I don't know if it's politically correct anymore, but she is boy crazy. All she can think about is who she's in love with, how cute is he, does he look at her, does he not look at her, her world soars and crashes depending on the attention of whoever her crush is of the moment and then eventually when she falls in love. And that and her longing for her mother from whom she is separated during the war are the through lines in her diary. Uh, and yet woven throughout, and that's what I'm going to show you in a few excerpts, is this awareness of what's happening in the wider world and the way that her feelings of passionate love and romantic love um, distract her and comfort her and cheer her up. And also that she's just kind of self-absorbed the way a teenager is by nature. So I will read you a few. Um, these are jumping around in what you have under number four. Um, I will go, so she is now in a, a ghetto area in the town of Pshemishal, which is in a border area um, between what used to be Poland and the Soviet Union. And so then um, she is under Soviet control for a while. On April 24th, 1940, Renya writes in her diary, terrible things have been happening. There were unexpected nighttime raids that lasted three days. People were rounded up and sent somewhere deep inside Russia. So many acquaintances of ours were taken away. There was terrible screaming at school. Girls were crying. They say 50 people were packed onto one, into one cargo train car. You could only stand or lie on bunks. And everybody was singing, Poland has not yet perished. So singing a patriotic song. About that Hollander boy I mentioned, I fell in love. I chased him like a mad woman, but he was interested in some girl named Basha. Despite that, I still like him, probably more than any other boy I know. Sometimes I feel this powerful, overwhelming need. Maybe it's just my temperament. I should get married early so I can withstand it. You should note, there is no ellipsis. There is no uh, dot, dot, dot between where I read to you, everyone singing Polish has not yet perished, and then about that Hollander boy I mentioned. These are the two things that are swirling around in her head. The, the terror, the chaos, the fear, and then getting lost in her reverie of her crush. And uh, that only persists throughout her diary. If we can go to the next couple of slides, please, Tani. The next one is just a random picture that I chose of a multi-generational family in Peshemishal. So again, it's not just a teenager like Renya, but it is old people, grandparents, parents, young children, um, all these interlocking relationships, and everyone is concerned about the people who are in their orbit. The next photo, which I think is just gorgeous, it's um, a devastating photo, but just the, the composition of it. There is a river that uh, is next to the town of Przemysl, and it bridges the river San, the San River. This is in the southern portion of Poland, Galicia. Uh, the area, actually, my father crossed this river during the war, so I have a special connection to this photo, but it shows Jews on the left, walking by foot, an elderly man, um, religious looking, observant, bearded, also clean shaven, um, more assimilated people, someone carrying a baby and um, troops on the right, um, because more and more Jews were being deported from nearby places into Pshemishal. Um, and it's against this backdrop that uh, I jump ahead to her diary entry, to Renya Spiegel's diary entry from June 21st, 1941, a date that may be significant to some of you if you're familiar with World War II history because it's the day of the surprise German invasion of the Soviet Union. But we need to also remember that news did not travel as quickly then as it does now. Uh, you don't hear things within 15 minutes of them happening by an alert on your phone. And on that day, uh, Renya did not know what was happening a few hours away. She would not know until some hours later. And instead, she's writing about her time with her boyfriend, Zygmunt. She's in a ghetto. It's war. 
And she writes, I love those green eyes. We kissed for the second time today. It felt so nice, but you know, it wasn't fiery or wild, but somehow delicate and careful, almost fearful, as if we didn't want to extinguish something that was growing between us. You will help me, Mama, she often implores uh, her absent mother at this, and God. And five days later, when she has heard the news and more violence has happened, she writes again, I can't write, I'm weak with fear. War again, war between Russia and Germany. Horrible days in the basement. Uh, give me my mama, save us, save Zygus is her boyfriend, Zygmunt. She says, I want to live so badly. Tonight is going to be terrible and I'm scared. Later she says, and here with really um, kind of painful self-awareness, she says, almost the whole city is in ruins. A piece of shrapnel fell into our house. These have been horrific days. Why even try to describe them? Words are just words. They can't express what it feels like when your whole soul attaches itself to a whizzing bullet, when your whole will, your whole mind, and all your senses hang from the flying missiles and beg, not this house. You're selfish, and you forget that the missile that misses you is going to hit somewhere, someone else. And later, she's afraid for her boyfriend and friends. So again, this kind of um, mixture of the events of caring for the people she cares about, but realizing that there is something bigger than her going on. Finally, uh, we get into kind of, she's, she's writing this diary, I said, for over 700 pages. For several years, she's writing into it. And if we can go to the next photo, Tani, please. Um, she writes, in June, 1942. And that is when that photo likely was taken, the one that I just showed you. Um, on June 3rd, 1942, the Germans murder almost all the Jewish residents in a particular neighborhood of Przemysl. And some 5,000 Jews from other Polish towns are deported there and being concentrated for more violence. So it's a, a period of um, extreme terror, violence, really almost like convulsions. But Around that same time, that same week, is when Renya and her boyfriend have sex for the first time, and she loses her virginity. And she writes about it in her diary. This is if you're following along in the text. On June 2nd, 1942, she writes, now I know what the word ecstasy means. It's indescribable. It's the best thing two loving creatures can achieve. For the first time, I felt this longing to become one, to be one body, and, well, to feel more, I could say. To bite and kiss and squeeze. And Zygos talked about a house and a car and about being the best man for me. I'm Lord God, I am so grateful to you for this affection and love and happiness. So she's having a huge milestone in the life of a teenage girl. Um, something she then writes about with joy and with shame and she doesn't want her family to know and she doesn't wanna tell her friends and she hopes she will marry him. And in one of her last entries uh, from June 7th, 42, she writes about violence and pogroms. And she says, I've, I've experienced so little of life. I don't wanna die. I'm scared of death. It's all so stupid, so petty, so unimportant, so small. Today, I'm worried about being ugly. Tomorrow, I might stop thinking forever. Uh, and in fact, she does. She is killed later that summer. And her boyfriend, Zygmunt, um, of whom she writes at great length in the kind of uh, obsessive way that only, I think, young lovers can feel about each other, um, he takes up her diary. He writes a number of other entries. And later, he actually saves her diary. And many, many years after the war, he gives it to her mother and sister who survived. And they have... Um, had the whole thing translated and you can find much, much more about her online. But I just, I love this source so much. It is so human, so vulnerable, so raw, uh, so unedited and, um, and just bursting with a lot of love. Shall I pause for questions, Julia, before the last section?
Julia, you're muted, but you. Okay, I'm not hearing Julia. Julia, if you're reading to us, we do not hear you. So I guess I will go on. Can you unmute her, Tani? Is she not able to unmute herself? So the final category of love relationships I wanna talk about, and hopefully to leave you on a slightly less depressing note, because my goal is not to leave you feeling totally glum, um, are healing relationships and ones that happen in the aftermath of the war in the time when approximately 250,000 European Jews, Holocaust survivors, are living in displaced persons camps in uh, locations all over, a lot in Germany, some in Czechoslovakia, other countries, but run by allied forces um, as places where they can begin to physically heal, uh, search for missing relatives, people whose fates they have not known, and uh, at times fall in love again. And I would like to turn to the next slide, please, Tani which is a wedding portrait. Uh, we will be seeing in a moment a picture of a bride and groom. There we go, thank you. This is uh, a woman named Hinda Chilevich and her groom, oh, wait, there we go. And her groom uh, with the fantastically wavy hair, uh, Velik Luxemburg, um, known after the war as Helen and William Luxemburg. They were married in March, 1947. And this is a formal portrait from that wedding at a camp for displaced persons in Germany, a place called Weiden Oberpfalz. Now, Hinda, the bride, uh, was also born in the town I mentioned earlier, Sosnowiec, the same place as Belatovi, whose testimony we heard. And her father owned a textile mill there. After the German invasion, the family remained for several years in Sosnowiec in uh, what's known as an open ghetto a place that is not with walls, but where they are still uh, subjected to arbitrary violence, starvation, uh, forced labor. In March, 1943, uh, young uh, Hinda was deported to a labor camp known as Gleivitz. And it was there that she met her future husband. So even in a place like a concentration camp, and this is not a unique story, young people did what young people do and fell in love. Um, she met Velik they talked through the fence between the men and women's barracks. They wrote letters to each other. Um, Velik would read reports in scraps of discarded newspaper uh, saying that Germany was losing the war and he was afraid that he would not survive. But he told Hinda, Helen, that they would survive and that he would later marry her. This was a promise that he made to her and one that she clung to after they were uh, both evacuated from this camp in January, 1945, and they were separated. At one point, uh, Velik was on a, what is known as a death march. You may have heard of these where thousands of prisoners are marched for days or weeks in the cold, in the snow, often barefoot without food. Um, he collapsed and he fell on the road waiting for a shot that did not come because often people, prisoners who collapsed were shot uh, to keep the uh, caravan moving. Uh, a farmer found him in the snow the next morning, took William to his barn. He fed him milk and bread. Uh, neighbors came by to gawk at him because they were st so stunned by his condition. Um, when the American army moved through the area, soldiers came to the barn and he was freed. But he weighed only 65 pounds at the time of his liberation. He was taken to an American field hospital and fed by IV. And um, he and Helen, I'm skipping a lot of history here because we don't have time, but um, they were reunited in August, 1946 at a displaced persons camp. They were each the only surviving members of their immediate families. And they were married on March 2nd, 1947. And if we can go to the next slide, um, this is a photograph from under the chupa at their wedding at a time in the ceremony when they were, um, noting the absence of all the loved ones who would normally be gathered around you at a time of happiness around a bride and groom. And you see them with the, the handkerchiefs on their faces. Um, but they found love. They found love during the war. It sustained them. Miraculously, they found each other. And if we could see the next slide, they were married, as I said, on March 2nd, 1947. 
Uh, here is a picture of their wedding party, which I wanted to show not just because it's charming, but also to imagine that among every one of these faces we're seeing of quite young people is its own trajectory of loss and displacement and what could have been and what they're cheated out of. And here they have something where even if they are not the brighter room, they can come together and celebrate a, a new beginning and something optimistic. And two years later, uh, Bill and Helen, as they were known, Luxembourg immigrated to the United States and they both later volunteered at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. I had the pleasure of knowing them for quite a few years and they really stayed in love till the end. Um, another story, lest you think that this is just a, a total anomaly, another similar story. Next slide, please. Story of this teenage girl on the left named Regina Gutmann. And on the right in the group photo, uh, the, the young man closest to us in the left foreground um, sitting at the table is named Sam Spiegel. Um, they were they too had been separated from their families when they met and they also fell in love in one of the most improbable of places, um, a Nazi camp. Um, Regina was from the Polish city of Radom and Sam was from Kozienice, which was a small town about 25 miles away. And at the time of the German invasion of Poland in September 1939, Regina was only 13 years old and Sam was 17. Life changed very quickly for them and their families. They uh, were forced to wear armbands. Excuse me, they had to leave their homes, move into ghettos. I do not have time. We could spend a whole hour just telling their life stories. But their lives intersect um, when they both find themselves in a labor camp in a small town named Pionki. Uh, Regina is there, and Sam is also um, deported to the Pionki labor camp. And it's there that these teenagers meet. And we can hear from Regina in her own words as an older woman, reflecting back to the first time that she met Sam. Young people, no matter where they are, they fall in love, you know. And um, Sam came in, and one time he turned around to me and says, I know you. And I said, you do? Are you from Radom? He said, no, I am from Kozienice. I said, I've never been to Kozienice. So how come you say you knew me? He said, I saw you once here walking around with some friends. And I remember you. And then I said to him, yes, so tell me what did I wear? <laughs> and really, he goes to describe my coat. If somebody would have asked me to describe my coat, I wouldn't have been able to do it. And since then, we really became friends, you know. So, um... I hope you are all smiling along with me. It is hard to listen to that without smiling, but also dynamics that we all recognize. You know, a guy sees a cute girl. He has what he hopes is a good opening, a kind of pickup line, and she calls him out on it and says, really, how, how could you know me? Um, but they fell in love. They became friends. And it's important to know the context. Um, there were some freedoms at the, a place like Pionki, this labor camp, that prisoners would not find in many other concentration camps or at a killing center, of course. And that's another point that I hope comes through from these stories, that there's not one uniform Holocaust narrative and that time and place matter greatly. Um, so how did their romance proceed? For example, sometimes Regina and Sam would be able to meet at a water spigot where they were both coming to fill a bucket with water. They could chat a little bit, they would talk. Um, to the question earlier about whether or not uh, German authorities tried to squelch friendships like this. Um, I know, for example, that in a two, I think a 2005, anyway, an interview much later in life, uh, Sam said once he was punished for speaking to Regina, and he remembered that he got 12 lashes for being caught talking to her, but he said it was worth it. Uh, so, you know, this was a risky relationship for them, but one that also kept them going. Um, similarly to the story I told you of the Luxembourgs, 
Um, as Soviet forces moved in from the east, the Germans wanted to empty Pionki. Sam and Regina were told they were being, quote, resettled, and they were together in a, a cattle car to an unknown destination. Um, and they found themselves at what they later learned was the Auschwitz camp complex. Uh, Regina, in testimony, later described a feeling in the air that they would never make it out of this place, and men and women were being separated. But Sam, again, took a big risk, and he ran over to her. He was desperate to maintain their connection, and he said to her, if we ever get out of here, meet me in my hometown so that they would have some plan for what to do. Um, they were very, very lucky. They were young. They were in fairly good physical shape. They were chosen for labor, uh, not immediately killed. They did not remain at Auschwitz for long. They were transported to different labor camps, eventually liberated, but of course, no contact between them, no idea if their sweetheart had survived. And they went back to their hometowns to search for their families, not just for their boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, Sam heard through word or mouth that Regina had survived, and he, as I said, their towns were fairly close together. He sent a horse and buggy for her um, to pick her up. That's a pretty romantic gesture. And they too were later married at a displaced persons camp in Germany. We have a photo of that, um, of them at the Vorenwald DP camp um, under the chupa, um, Regina and Sam. Um, in a, a strange turn, actually, uh, Regina and Sam were also longtime volunteers at the Holocaust Museum. I adored them, I adored their story. I actually had this photo up in my office for quite a while. And years later in the you can't make this stuff up category, um, I got to talking to a, a doctor at a doctor's appointment, gastroenterologist, and he said, oh, my parents were the, the best man and maid of honor at that wedding. Um, so they were up on my wall. But uh, Regina and Sam were married for 70 years. They had three daughters who live here in the Washington area. They began volunteering at the Holocaust Museum before our doors opened. And next photo, just so you can see what they grew up to be and their love story. Um, he, Sam, unfortunately, uh, sadly, we lost Sam. He died in 2016 and Regina in 2019. And I hope they are reunited uh, somewhere. Um, before we go to the last batch of questions, I just want to show you a few more photos about the kinds of lives that were being reborn through uh, love, through bonds of love in displaced persons camps. Uh, next photo, please. In the displaced persons camps where I mentioned uh, around a quarter of a million Holocaust survivors lived are some of the highest birth rates ever recorded. People who were robbed of their entire families were very eager to make new ones. Not all of these love matches proved very enduring, I have to say. You know, these are people sometimes so eager and desperate for family that many marriages were impulsive. Um, and also people with a lot of emotional scars and a lot of trauma, um, but a lot of babies. Um, and there are some beautiful, beautiful photos. In this case, uh, we have three couples posing with their babies in a displaced persons camp called Gaberze in 1947, Germany. In the center are uh, with the long hair is David and Bella Pearl who met and married after the war and they're holding their baby daughter, Rachel, along with peers also with babies. Um, next slide, please. I love this one so much, um, but again, a complicated story. It's not just a chubby cheek toddler um, with a baby carriage. Here we have little Miriam Graubart um, born in uh, another DP camp in March, 47. Uh, her parents were also Polish Jews, uh, one from Sochachev, uh, Henrik Raubart, and her mother, Guta, was from the city of Lodz. Uh, but this is not just a happy new beginning. Um, in addition to the uh, blood relatives who were killed, both of her parents had been married before the war. Um, their previous husband and wife did not survive. And little baby Miriam's mother, Guta, also had a young son named Olesh who was murdered during the war. So these are complicated families with a lot of grief and new beginnings, but it's not like it's a happy ending. Um, there is a shadow over it. And the final photo, I don't know who the people are, but I just think it's so beautiful and evocative. Um, a boy and an adult looking down, I hope you can see, it looks like a newborn infant um, with its mouth open, maybe yawning, maybe crying with its hand in the air um, at the Schlachtensee DP camp uh, near Berlin. 
and uh, just the, the optimism, the hope, the new love that an image like that represents. So I hope I've given you some sense of the sustaining and galvanizing uh, power of this most elusive and uncontainable of feelings, love. And I would be happy to take more questions for the time we have remaining. Those are amazing, um, amazing pictures. Um, there was a question about, um, about uh, I'm now forgetting the name of the, of the girl whose diary we looked at. Renya. Renya. Um, about parents encountering these sort of, you know, these um, very personal love narratives of their children. Uh, of course, we know, you know, that Otto Frank had a parallel experience, I guess. I'm sure you know about others. Um, I don't know if you have, like, can you shed any light on that? It's, it's um, right, there's discomfort there, and yet that's all that you have left of your child. Do you share it for the historical record, but it's so personal? Yeah, I mean, that. I think those issues are, as you said, well known because of Otto Frank, but it's repeated over and over. Um, in the case of Renya Spiegel, her family history um, is a, a complicated one in that her mother and sister survived by assuming Catholic, Polish Catholic identities, so much so that her sister uh, continued to live as a Catholic after the war, as did her mother. They felt that the church had, had rescued them. Um, her sister, once she came to the US, and I, again, I'm summarizing, but if you go to the link I have in the text, you can read more in Smithsonian Magazine. Uh, her sister didn't even tell her husband when she married that she was actually Jewish and had had this whole family experience. And then later, when she was raising her American children as Catholic, one of them came home from school saying anti-Semitic things. And so she told them, actually, this is my history, your history. It was only many years later that the boyfriend I mentioned, Zygmunt, who survived, found them and gave them this diary. And if I recall correctly, the mother and sister didn't want to look at it for a while. Um, I think it's a combination of it's both very, very painful to be reminded of the person who you have lost, who was murdered, and also this sense that perhaps you're violating their privacy, that, you know, that it's intimate, that there are things they didn't want you to know or didn't, would, certainly wouldn't want the world to know. Um, I know I have an agreement with my own sister. She's told me that if she dies, she's told me where her diaries are and she wants me to throw them away, destroy them. And she does not want anyone to look in them. And I assume, you know, that's a way that you can say the honest things that you feel about the people you know um, with the expectation that no one's gonna look at it. So I do think there is that tension of what do we have a right to know? If so, when, um, who, who is in charge of how we interpret that? Um, also projecting our values on it in the past versus now. So it's, these are not simple texts and the authors of them are not usually around to tell us what, what their preferences are. So it's an equivocating answer because I have mixed feelings about it myself. Right, it sounds like you, you, you're talking about your own feelings as a scholar of this material also not, right? Yes, but also I think what, what meaning can we get? You know, there, there, is no, there is no justification for the murder of a teenage girl. And I kind of wince at the expression lessons of the Holocaust because it makes it sound like something happens for a reason. Like maybe I'm just nihilistic in my view of the world, but I think there is nothing to be gained from it. However, if you have a document like Renya Spiegel's diary, which is so no holds barred, visceral, real, relatable, it's a way to get teenagers today to identify with someone in an ancient looking black and white photo. And to me, that is um, some meaning, not a moral, not a purpose, but something that we can draw out of it so that she has agency. She has um, an impact long after her life was cut short. And that to me is powerful. But if she were alive today, I'm guessing she would not share this diary. It's pretty personal but her family has chosen to share it and that gives us the permission to examine it. Right. And, you know, for me, it, it makes me think about just all the millions of people whose who's all record of them has been erased. Um, not, not, not their names necessarily, but you know, any of the substance of, of who they were in the world. Um, and it has such tremendous value 
just because of that, because of all the, because of all of the diaries that, um, and all the life stories that we don't have. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm sure a lot of people have, um, you know, we're all focused on this, the, the, um, censorship of, um, the banning of novs in, um, in that school district in Tennessee. Um, and it's, you know, your session is really making me think about how there's so many, um, there's so many levels of problematics with that, that kind of, um, censorship and banning, um, you know, and there's, 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 there's all of the, um, you know, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble uh, coming up with the words. It, it's it, the, all of the problems of, um, you know, lessening the, or, or eliminating um, Holocaust education um, in in schools, but it's also erasing individual people's stories. That's what I was, what I was trying to get to. Um, but there's, there's both of those going on. Also of stories and versions of them that are unvarnished and that are maybe uncomfortable. And that's why I wanted to be careful. And I'll emphasize it again, that as much as I'm showing the restorative and sustaining power and all the good things about love here, there are also thousands and thousands of stories of people who feel betrayed where someone who they thought they could count on doesn't come through. Um, someone who loved them chooses themselves, uh, and, you know, not to have some rosy view. And I think one reason I don't think from having read the transcript of that school board meeting in Tennessee that they were conscious of it, but it is a very, very Jewish version of the Holocaust that you get in Mouse in that it is um, angry. It's an angry version and it's warts and all. And you see the damage in the Spiegelman family and the, the loss and the way that that reverberates through generations and inherited pain. And it's not redemptive. Um, and you know, since we are here speaking in the context of a Jewish seminary, it is a very unchristian way of looking at the Holocaust. Um, there are no martyrs in Art Spiegelman's version of the Holocaust there, it is nihilistic. And uh, I think that is uncomfortable, uh, especially for a lot of evangelical Christians that it doesn't focus on that element of it. It just is raw pain. Well, I know that you have a have a hard stop at 3.30. So um, why don't we wrap up here? I'm, I'm so grateful to you. And I know I know everyone is um, just for for aggregating and sharing this material with us. It's just it's, it's so powerful. It gives such it's a New York siren for you. Um, <laughs> Um, it just gives, it gives such contour to, to something so massive. Um, so thank you so much for helping us connect in that way and just bringing us all of this um, documentary material that, that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. I want to just remind people again, what you said that the, um, that the, the, the video testimonials are on the, um, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum website. Um, and um, and I also want to thank Linda Zisk again for sponsoring the session in memory of David Zisk. Um, I hope it's a fitting tribute, Linda. And uh, thanks to everyone for coming. We will see you again, not next week because it's President's Day, but um, in two weeks' time. And thank you so much again, Dr. Friedberg, for teaching us today. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>